please welcome Chief, Chief Operating Officer of the Freedom Forum Institute, Gene Polisinski. Thank you. I uh, always feel like you should wait until I'm done to decide whether you want to do that or not. But I, but I appreciate the confidence builder. Um, welcome to this third annual program on the future of speech online. Uh, to the museum and to this night conference center. Um, please let me open by recognizing the partners in presenting the program today. The Center for Democracy and Technology, the Charles Koch Institute, and the operation where I work, the Freedom Forum Institute. Nice to have you here. Um, well, I would be remiss if I did not mention that this marvelous museum building and conference facility will close December 31st to the public, but no less remiss in saying very loudly and proudly that the work and the mission will go on. The work of the Freedom Forum, the Freedom Forum Institute, and the museum continues on fi a firmer financial footing, and as the saying goes, allow us, allowing us to not just survive, but to thrive. So we look forward to meeting with you next year in uh, some new administrative offices we have, which are a few blocks away, which also has convening space. So we've already talked about the fourth such conference. So we'll see you there. Um, we are here to consider the future, not just ours, but everyone's. But being a little bit of a contrarian, let me spend my few moments at this place to consider the past from the future. And this fictional exercise is worth doing because considering the past from whatever vantage point we stand lets us measure, learn, grow for the future. So years from now, some of you and others yet to join in this conversation, um, will ask some questions similar to what's being considered today. Uh, and of course those questions will know in no small measure determine what kind of world, society, structure of governance we will have down the cyber road. What will they think of us? Will they praise us of this time for finding ways and tools to preserve the freedom of access to ever greater amounts of information or bemoan our failure to encourage and protect that great potential online pool of data research and the exchange of ideas? Will those future evaluators celebrate a world in which the word free is simply assumed to be part of uh, and included with the word speech? Or will censors, elites, bureaucrats, and repressive governments have divided and controlled information along social, religious, regional, or economic boundaries to the detriment of us all? Will technology in the digital future assist the democratic process and have encouraged an unprecedented explosion, an awareness of the recognition and the possibilities of the human mind and spirit, or will that technology have fostered manipulation, misuse, so as to create confusion, distrust, division, and misinformation to such a degree that what I would call those four horsemen of a digital apocalypse overwhelm ideas and systems resting in civility, discussion, consensus, and yes, democracy. I know that we will not get the answers to all of those issues or questions today, but I know from the past years of this conference and from the work of many of you that you have ideas about those answers, including our opening speaker, Roger Dingledine, co-founder of the nonprofit Tor Project. Roger is a computer scientist who is committed to helping individuals on a worldwide basis to have private, secure connections to an uncensored internet. And that commitment and passion has led to the creation of Tor, first as a routing project and then to the browser that many of us know today. It's a tool for activists and journalists and pro-privacy internet users and those seeking to get past the firewalls of censors and yet protect their identity. I'm delighted to welcome Roger to kick off our day in this conference and would charge him and all of you with two thoughts from figures of the past, not generally associated with our topic of the future, but I think they're appropriate. As Buddha is once said to have written, no one saves us in our future but ourselves. No one can, can and no one may. We must walk that path alone. And then Mother Teresa, who advised, yesterday is gone. Tomorrow is not yet here. We have only today. Let us begin. Thank you very much.
Okay, does the microphone work? Sounds like yes. And very soon I will have some slides. Maybe I'll press the forward button and see if that causes slides to exist. There are some nice people back there who are... There we go. Awesome. Okay, so hi everybody. I'm Roger Dingledine and I'm going to uh, start you off thinking about a bunch of different topics so that we can be thinking about them for the rest of the day. Uh, so the first, uh, apparently my, my uh, talk is entitled The Technology of Speech Online. And speech online is a big and broad topic. There's social media platforms and Facebook and so on. There's uh, communication tools, Signal and Tor. There's uh, journalists and activists. I'll put them on the same line to, to blur the line for us this morning. Um, and then there's web censorship of people trying to get to websites and websites blocking people from interacting with them. Uh, and then we've got the surveillance and the self-censorship and the chilling effects. So there are a bunch of different things that speech online might mean. I'm going to mostly focus on the web browsing speech online side, but I'll try to, to pull in a bunch of other things. So a little bit of background to start. Uh, I work on a nonprofit organization called the Tor Project. We try to write software to keep people safer on the internet and teach people around the world what it means to be safe on the internet. We're a 501c3. One of the cool things about Tor is the uh, community of researchers and developers and activists around the world who work with us to, to, uh, to make it all work. So how many people here know about Tor in some form? I've got, okay, awesome, great. Okay, so uh, the, the most common use of Tor is called Tor Browser. The idea is uh, you download it and it builds a path through the Tor network, which is based on volunteers around the world who are running Tor relays, and your connections pop out the other side, and, and the goal is that somebody watching you can't learn what you're doing on the internet, and somebody at the website end can't learn where you're coming from, and no central point in the middle gets to learn both who you are and what you're doing. So we've got some number of users. It's a privacy system, so it's a bit hard to tell, but somewhere between 2 million and 8 million daily users. So at this point, it's the average Tor user is the average internet user. It's the average Facebook person, the average Twitter person. It's not a bunch of weird dissidents who are all trying to uh, figure out how to install the software. Uh, it's millions of people every day. Okay, so. Uh, our introducer mentioned the phrase computer science, so I'll have one slide to, uh, to talk about it from the computer science side. In security, we have this notion of threat model, which is what attacker are you trying to protect against? What, what, are, you, what are you imagining that the attacker is going to be able to do? So in this situation, we've got Alice. She wants to connect to some website, Bob. Where can the attacker be? Maybe the attacker is watching Alice's local network, meaning maybe it's Starbucks, uh, maybe it's the Monopoly telephone company in Tunisia, something like that. Maybe it's Comcast. Uh, or maybe the attacker's watching on the Bob side. Uh, they want to know who connects to WikiLeaks. Or maybe it's CNN and they want to track all of their users. Or maybe the attacker's in the middle of the network. Maybe that's AT&T. I guess that means it's NSA. So there are a bunch of different places that we might worry about in terms of who gets to look at, at what sort of data. And Anonymity is not the same as encryption. Encryption is good, you should use encryption, but even when you're using encryption, people looking at the traffic get to learn who you're talking to, when you're talking to them, how much you're talking to them, and that's actually what the intelligence agencies attack these days. Nobody tries to break the encryption. It's all about, let's build a social graph of who's talking to who, figure out the interesting person in the middle, and then break into their house and rearrange their laptop or something like that. So encryption is good, but it's not enough. And speaking of that, everybody's seen uh, creepy NSA dude and his phrase, we kill people based on metadata. So this, this, this phrase metadata is really important because a lot of folks over the past decades have been thinking about securing communications data, what you say. But a lot fewer people have been thinking about the metadata side, the information about the information. Okay, so... When I, I actually only use the phrase anonymity when I'm talking to other researchers. When I'm talking to my parents, I tell them I'm working on a privacy system because privacy is a good you know, American value. Anonymity, I'm not sure, but, but privacy is important. And then when I'm talking to companies, I'm working on communication security or network security because companies... I hear privacy is dead, anonymity is, you know, what do I need that for? Uh, but security, you're right, I, I do need security. And then when we're talking to governments and militaries, we work on traffic analysis resistant communication networks. <laughs> and again, it's the same system, it's the same security properties, it's the same software, it's the same network of volunteers, but figuring out how to phrase it for different people so that they can see 
that, that it impacts them, that it matters for them, uh, is the important part here. And then there's the fourth category that we can also talk about, which is the reachability side. It's the folks in Turkey saying, I want to get to BBC, but people are blocking the internet for me. So one of the important points for Tor is this diversity of users is critical for safety of all of the users. You can't have the Egyptian political dissident privacy system because then everybody knows why you're installing it and why you're using it. You need the cancer survivors and the police and the bloggers and the activists and so on all in one network. And that same principle applies to a lot of other communication tools. Like imagine if the signal messenger were only used by Egyptian dissidents. That would, that would totally change the perspective of the world on what it's for and who you are if you're using it. So that diversity of users is, is a theme that we'll see throughout. Okay, so another key point about Tor is the distributed trust or uh, separating uh, the, 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 the initiator, the sender from the destination that they're going to. So in a lot of VPN and anonymizer situations, there's one central point and it learns all the data. It sees who's talking to who, it knows when they're talking, it has everything and it promises not to tell anybody. And I was actually talking to one of these VPN anonymizer companies a while ago. Uh, I won't say which one. And they're like, we never answer subpoenas. If I ever answered a subpoena, nobody would ever trust us ever again. So of course we never answer subpoenas. And then I was doing a talk for the US Department of Justice six months later, and they interrupted me and they're like, why can't you be like anonymizer? It's easy, we send them a subpoena, they send us an answer. It's easy, why can't you be like that? And I don't, I don't want to pick on a particular company. The problem is the architecture. The problem is the centralization where they have the data and they could screw you and they promise not to. So privacy by promise is not what I want. I want privacy by design or privacy by the, the way the, the software works by default makes no central points that have all the information. And that ties in directly to the Facebook end-to-end -end encryption discussion. Uh, I love the, the phrasing here. We've got, uh, yeah, uh, we are writing to request that Facebook does not proceed with its plan to implement end-to-end -end encryption across its messaging services without ensuring that there is no reduction to user safety. So I actually talk about user safety in that same phrase as before, privacy, anonymity, security, safety, they're all synonyms from my perspective. So keeping people safe by protecting their data is, is, is what encryption is for. That is what safety is. So it's fascinating that the other side is saying, we need everybody to be unsafe so that they can be safe. <laughs> this is a, certainly something that we should keep on talking about, but, uh, but go Facebook for actually considering the safety of its users and wanting to uh, provide a secure tool by default. And I was, yesterday I was talking to some FBI people who were like, I don't understand, Facebook has the data and we ask for it and then they say they don't have it, why are they lying to us? And the answer is, if they're building end-to-end -end encryption correctly, they don't have the data. They have designed a system where they're not in the middle, where they're out of the loop. Now, it's more complicated than that because it's still a centralized messenger and they still see all the metadata. They know who you're talking to and when and so on. But they at least don't know what you're saying. And that is a, a good step forward. And the world should have more uh, security and safety in its tools. Okay, so skipping to another topic. Uh, this is the Tor website from a bunch of interesting companies, uh, countries around the world. So we've got, uh, this site has been blocked due to content contrary to the laws of the Sultanate. If you believe the website you're trying to access does not contain any such content, please send us your name, your address, your email, your phone number, and why you think it should be unblocked so that we can put you on a list of people who are sad about blocking. And there are a bunch of other examples. Uh, Surf safely, this website not accessible in the UAE. And Here's another one, uh, access to the site is currently blocked, it fails the UAE's internet access management policy. Uh, this site has been blocked uh, in Qatar. So the other fun thing, they try to make it fun. Like they've got this goofy dude like, you know, oops, uh, we're fascists. Oops, the, the website didn't work. You know, it, we're, we're not blocking you, we're not censoring you. It's just, you know, they, you shouldn't have done that. So there, there's a recurring theme also of, uh, it's not that they're, you know, trying to, to show that they're in charge. They're just trying to make it fun. Censorship is, you know, it's, it's, it's a culturally normal thing. So one approach to that 
is a project called UNI, the Open Observatory for Network Interference. And the idea for UNI is uh, to build a global testing infrastructure where you can install it on your phone and you can do tests from wherever you are. And the idea is uh, you get people all around the world to measure how the internet behaves, whether you can reach BBC, whether you can use Tor, whether you can do all sorts of protocols. And then at the same time, you make the same request over Tor or over other channels, and then you compare them. And then you publish all the data. So now they have a huge public data set of something like 400 million measurements from all around the world. And the goal is that everybody around the world can, uh, can start evaluating these things. They've got uh, a bunch of different uh, ways in, that you can use your browser to interact with their data and explore it and try to figure out what's going on in Vietnam and so on. One of the interesting challenges for UNI, so they started off thinking, We've, we've got to make this like a technical project so that everybody knows that we're scientists, so that nobody's going to think this is a political thing. All we're doing is factually measuring what happens on the internet. We're not judging, we're not saying, you know, this is good or bad. We're just telling you this worked, this didn't work. And that approach means that it's safer to be an uni user in each of these countries because you're just participating in science, you're helping an engineering global project and so on. Uh, but then they found that they have a huge pile of data set that no journalist knows how to understand. So then they realized, okay, what we need to do is talk to some journalists in the background and point them at the data and write some paragraphs for them, but then the journalists write the things. And then they realized, wait a minute, we've got all this data and we know what it means, so we should write up. So they've got an amazing set of, of blog entries on Nigeria and Ethiopia and Libya and so on, uh, looking at the shutdowns and censorship that they see. But there's definitely a balance between, uh, look, we're a, a neutral technology project versus, oh my God, did you just see what happened in Saudi Arabia? Okay, and the other answer for that is what's called pluggable transports. This is on the Tor side. So Tor works in almost every country. There are a couple of places like China and sometimes Egypt and sometimes Venezuela where it's more complicated. And if you're in one of those situations and you're being censored, then uh, they try to censor connections into the Tor network as well. And so the goal of the pluggable transport design is to change where you're connecting and what your traffic looks like so that it's much harder for them to be able to block uh, connections into the Tor network. And from there, if you can reach Tor, then you can reach BBC and all the other places that you might want to go to. Okay, speaking of which, uh, this is the website for the conference that I'm speaking at right now. This is swugo.com. I hadn't heard of swugo.com before. Uh, but when I go there over tour, also when I went there from Taiwan, this was the page that I got. And I, I guess it looks at my IP address and says, I don't want to serve content to you. So I was going to investigate swugo.com, but actually this is the only page I can get from them. So I have no idea who swugo.com is. So this is an example not of censorship of people trying to reach web pages, but the web page itself saying, I don't want to hear from people like that. They're coming from Taiwan, nope, they don't, they don't need my contact. They're coming from Tor, I don't need to answer them. And it gets more complicated. Here's the LA Times from Tor browser. The LA Times is like, hey, you're in private browsing mode, I don't need to give you content. Log in, pay me, otherwise I, I won't give you the articles. And the New York Times is doing that these days. Uh, and, I mean, you can turn off JavaScript and then this thing won't pop up and you can read the articles if you know how to do that and, and care enough to do it. But there's a growing balkanization partitioning uh, of websites around the world where they say, hey, I, I don't need to answer your question. I don't need to, to, to provide my content to you. And here's a, a it, the font is way too small for you to see, but maybe we'll send the slides around later. But uh, uh, here's a, a blog, here's a, a post on a forum a while ago saying, uh, I tried to access this website, but Cloudflare had blocked access. I contacted them and they said, unfortunately, we had to ban all of Vietnam due to a massive DDoS today. We will reevaluate, remove the ban as soon as possible. I'm curious about this. Is it reasonable to ban an entire country? After four days, the ban is still in place. Would the ban be in place if the DDoS had originated in the US or in Europe? Excellent question. So here's an example where Cloudflare, a major hosting provider of like 10 or 20 percent of the websites out there, decided that a country didn't need to access the web for those four days or I don't know how the, the story ended. So this is a, a, a growing thing that we in America don't really think about where 
places around the world. I mean, uh, I think I was talking to the, the folks who run Macy's.com, and they've stopped answering requests from Africa because it's not like you're actually going to buy something from them if you're coming in from Africa. So why not just stop serving content there? We'll save some money. We don't have to spend bandwidth on people like that. Uh, that that's a, a terrible world we're moving towards. And Wikipedia is another interesting example here. Uh, how am I doing on time? I, I'll, I'll wait until somebody walks up and... Okay, great. Uh, okay, so Wikipedia is another fun example here where they block Tor edits. You can read Wikipedia over Tor, but you can't edit Wikipedia over Tor. And that means that uh, if you're in China and you can't reach Wikipedia and you use Tor in order to get to the rest of the internet, then you successfully get to Tor, you successfully get to Wikipedia, and then Wikipedia says, screw you, I don't want to hear from you. And there... So there are a couple of interesting stories to go with that, but I'm going to speed up because I've got a lot of other uh, things to talk about. So another piece that we can talk about is the browser privacy side of things. So we talked about Tor before, which was like network level privacy. But the second piece is all the stuff inside your browser that you need to keep you safe, like uh, what fonts you admit to having, what cookies you have, how, how many pixels by how many pixels your browser window is. So there are a bunch of... Uh, pieces in there in terms of how to, how to keep people safe on the internet. We now finally have a Tor browser for Android, which is awesome. And uh, something else important to know, how many people here have heard of private browsing mode or incognito mode, stuff like that? So DuckDuckGo did a study a while ago asking people what they thought private browsing mode was, and most of them thought that it would keep you safe from a network level adversary. So private browsing mode, the goal is somebody who comes to look at your hard drive after you, after you do a, a web browsing session shouldn't be able to learn what you did. It does not aim at all to protect you against your ISP or Google or other advertising companies. And a lot of people thought that, I mean, it's called private browsing mode. Shouldn't it keep me safe from the internet surveillance tracking uh, organizations? So another way of looking at that is actually private browsing mode is what Tor Browser does. So there are a growing number of organizations like Mozilla and Brave that are working on integrating Tor into their browser uh, so that rather than putting a big pile of, of small font saying, this isn't what you think it is, instead you can actually fix the program to be what everybody hopes it will be. Okay, and then uh, moving on to another fun topic. A while ago, uh, Ed Snowden brought out a bunch of interesting documents, and he tried to get as much about Tor as he could. So the first uh, approach to that, the first answer to that is, we've got this really intriguing quote from, I don't know if it was NSA or GCHQ, uh, saying that Tor is still the king of high secure, low latency internet anonymity. There are no contenders for the throne. It's a pretty awesome endorsement from some anonymous NSA person. Uh, but that was also like five, six, seven years ago now, so it's hard to know what has uh, moved on. The other thing that, that we got to learn a lot more about is how global internet surveillance works. So the censorship arms race is no fun because it's a couple of people on the tour side and a few other groups working against, China has something like 30,000 people uh, working for their great firewall. So the asymmetry there in terms of funding and people and so on is really bad. But at least in the censorship case, I try a thing, it doesn't work. I change it, it works. I've got, there's a feedback loop. I know whether I'm being censored. In the surveillance case, I try a thing, I wonder if I'm being censored, I change it, I still wonder if I'm being censored. There's no feedback. We don't know how they're surveilling and whether they're looking at a given connection or traffic or people going to a certain website. So there's, because of that lack of feedback, it's really hard to understand how to build uh, tools and mechanisms that will, that will protect people against the censorship side. Yet another topic, Australia censors the internet. Denmark censors the internet. Sweden censors the internet. England censors the internet. And that means that when the US State Department, yes, this is the actual, honest to God, official Chinese logos of the Great Firewall, uh, we talked about how this was, you know, you try to make it fun. We're not totalitarian. It's just cartoon people keeping you safe. And, and when you see this on a website, you're like, oh, shit, I, I, I guess I shouldn't go to websites like this. So it, it, it helps remind people. So when the U.S. State Department goes to China and says, you're being a bad country for blocking a lot of web pages, you need to stop censoring the Internet, China quite reasonably says, 
look, we're just keeping our people safe, just like you do. Why are you picking on us? Everybody blocks things on the internet. And that leads to, there are some situations where tools like Tor really aren't going to, to solve very much. How many people here know the phrase East Turkestan? A couple. How many people here know the phrase uh, Xinjiang or the Uyghur province or the concentration camps in China? Uh, a couple more, but, but not many more. Okay, so uh, there's this horrible thing happening in northwest China right now where they have somewhere between 1 million and 5 million people in concentration camps. And I was talking to folks uh, who uh, used to be there, and they were explaining uh, there's a Han Chinese person living in my house. They sent somebody to come li live with us so that they could watch everything we're doing. And they take my children away and put them in re-education camps. And I get to see them one hour a week on the other side of a chain link fence. But they spend the entire hour, my child spends the entire hour yelling at me about being a bad Chinese person because they're learning about a different China than, than my culture. So there are some situations where uh, safety tools on the internet are not good enough. If you have uh, checkpoints every block where you have to prove your identity and you're not the right uh, level of person in society, so you're not allowed to go into that part of the city, you're not allowed to have that kind of job. Uh, so there's a lot more we can talk about there. Tor onion services. How many people here know the phrase uh, onion services? Uh, a handful. Okay, great. So there is a feature that Tor has. I talked earlier about I can go to some websites safely. The, the, the second feature is I can offer a service on the internet where people can reach me over the Tor network and then they get better privacy properties while they're going there. You don't have to worry about... Uh, so there's this phrase called certificate authorities. It's how HTTPS works. It's how the little lock shows up in your browser. Except the little lock shows up in your browser if any of... 350 companies around the world vouches for the website you're going to. So if you're in Turkey and you go to Facebook.com and Turkish Telecom wants to lie to you about who is Facebook, then they can put a little lock up there. It looks good to you, but actually you're talking to Turkish Telecom's Facebook. You're not talking to the actual Facebook. So uh, one example of an interesting Onion service that the world set up, that Facebook set up, uh, they added their website as a Tor Onion service. So now you can reach their website uh, with full end-to-end -end encryption inside the Tor network in a way that you're no longer vulnerable to, uh, awesome, in a way that you're no longer vulnerable to uh, attackers in the country you're in or something like that. Uh, BBC just set one up a few weeks ago, and there's another uh, comparable organization that's setting one up, and I won't spoil their thunder, they'll be announcing it next week. Uh, Cloudflare also offers Onion services, which they run 10 to 20% of the internet, so actually you can reach 10 to 20% of the internet this way. I'm going to skip over a couple more interesting slides to talk about two other interesting examples of communication tools. So, Onion Share. Imagine you're a journalist, somebody just gave you a cool whistleblowing document, and so you, here you are holding this classified thing, and you want to give this classified thing to the journalist sitting next to you at your workplace. How do you send it to them? Do you send it over Gmail? That's probably not best. Do you put it on Dropbox? Dropbox looks at everything, they probably sell things. Do you set up an FTP server and then the other person FTPs it? That, that works great if you know what I just said. Uh, so there, there aren't, do you put it on a USB key? But we've all been trained not to share USB keys like that. So the answer is a tool called OnionShare where it pops up a little website on your computer only available as an Onion address. It tells you the Onion address. You send that to uh, your journalist over some secure messaging channel or something. Then they click on it into our browser and then they download the file and then the website goes away and there's nothing left in the world. So this is a, a really uh, fascinating new way of sharing documents in a way that there's no centralization, there's no center, there's no place to go to afterwards, and, uh, and a lot of people are using this these days to be safer on the internet. And I am out of time, so there are a bunch of other things we could talk about. Hopefully I've gotten you thinking about a bunch of the topics on uh, speech online and the technology of speech online. So if you can uh, help the world be a better place, I'd love to chat with you. Thank you. And I will stand here awkwardly until somebody replaces me. 
Ladies and gentlemen, just joining us, there are more seats to the back. Please join us. And now, please welcome Representative and Director of European Affairs for the Center for Democracy and Technology, Jens Jeppesen. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the uh, uh, invitation to participate here. I'm very, very excited about it. I will stand here awkwardly until the panel joins me. <laughs> I very much hope that the panel participants are with me. So uh, one thing that was very clear from, from Roger's presentation now is that what we're talking about today is really an international trend. The appetite of governments and policymakers from across the world, the appetite for restricting uh, speech for uh, keeping various types of content off the internet. I'll go that on the far right. Um, so just just last week, uh, just last week there was a um, there was a an article in the Economist uh, newspaper uh, called Splinternet Net Loss, and, um, and 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 it cites examples from places like Singapore, Australia, UK, China, Saudi Arabia, Germany the U European Union, France, India, uh, and even the US. So this is truly a global discussion, and, and I think we're very lucky to have with us uh, at this panel speakers who can uh, talk about these issues from uh, a wealth of perspe perspectives, both, both uh, technology, uh, policy, policy uh, legal, uh, and geographical. So the way we will run the panel uh, is uh, each panelist uh, will kind of set the stage from their perspective uh, uh, for about five minutes. Uh, we'll do a round, and then we'll have some inter interaction, uh, and, and panelists will be able to uh, respond to each other's points. Uh, and then we want to open it, open it up to, um, uh, to you in the room. But um, just by way of introduction, uh, we have with us uh, Alp uh, Toker, uh, who is executive director Global Internet Observatory and Cyber Security Watchdog Netblocks. Very interested to hear what, what you do. Uh, we have uh, Billy Easley, uh, who is with Americans for Prosperity, um, and he is uh, responsible for looking at technology and free speech issues. We have Courtney Ratch, uh, who is Advocacy, Advocacy Director uh, uh, at the uh, Committee to Protect journalist and serves as chief spokesperson on global press freedom issues, among other things. And we have Evelyn Aswad, a professor at the University of uh, Oklahoma, and has a very broad uh, and deep experience in human rights law. So uh, with that, uh, I want to kick it off. And I think perhaps we can start with, um, with Evelyn. Um, because so as, as governments are grappling with these content issues and, and, and try to restrict various types of content, they are constrained, at least in theory, by some legal frameworks that protect free expression. Could you perhaps give us a, an overview of what the legal bed, bed, bedrock is? Sure, happy to, and thank you for having me here. Is the microphone working? No. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, I think it's very important for uh, everyone in civil society, everyone interested in this space, to hold governments to the international standard for protecting freedom of expression. And essentially, that's found in Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It's a treaty that has 172 state parties, uh, but it's also generally just viewed as the global principled standard for speech, and it applies to any restrictions governments put on speech, whether offline or online. And essentially, um, it has very broad protections for speech covering um, the ability of individuals to uh, impart, receive, transmit information across frontiers over any media. It does allow governments to restrict speech if they can meet a three-part test. And this is a one-strike-you're-out test, and the government has the burden of proving each part of the test is met. So in a nutshell, here are the three parts, and I encourage people to hold governments when they try to restrict speech on the internet to uh, meeting their burden under each of these tests. The first one is the legality test. At the very least, uh, the restriction must not be vague. 
And the UN's machinery, including the Special Rapporteur, the top expert at the UN on free speech, has noted a vast number of laws that are vague um, in terms of uh, banning offensive speech or um, really a variety of things uh, uh, that some would call hate speech, et cetera. The, the uh, restriction must be narrowly uh, phrased and give appropriate notice to individuals and to employees administering the rule. Next, the rule must be imposed for a legitimate reason. This is the legitimacy prong. And these are public interests that are set forth in the treaty text, such as uh, public health, public order, et cetera. Many times governments invoke these as a pretext for just protecting the regime. That is not OK. okay? And the last test, I think, is, is the biggest hook in many ways. It's the necessity test. Under this test, if a government puts a restriction on speech, it must be the least intrusive infringement on freedom of expression. And that means a government has to answer three questions. First, can it achieve that legitimate purpose without banning speech at all, just through good governance measures, right? Um, can it have, for example, to promote tolerance, interfaith dialogues, educational programs, um, government condemnation of, of hate groups, et cetera, rather than bans on speech? If all those good governance measures, and there are many more, don't work, then the government has to prove of its available tools it has selected the least restrictive means. So for example, is it choosing a criminal sanction rather than a civil sanction, et cetera? And further, the last part is it must think through, is the speech restriction working? Is it counterproductive? Um, if it's not working or if it's uh, counterproductive, that speech restriction cannot be sustained under international human rights law. Now, I will also mention there are many provisions in human rights law that require bans on speech for various forms of hate speech, but those all must pass through this rigorous three-part test. And if you've read Nadine Strassen's uh, recent book on um, hate speech, she makes a, a big case that vague, the vagueness prong and least intrusive means really go a long way in uh, restricting government's authority over individual speech. So that would just um, kind of make that plea for people to uh, use uh, this provision of human rights law in your advocacy against government restrictions on speech. It's there, it's global, and it's principled. Thank you very much, Evelyn, for that uh, succinct and very clear explanation. Um, I want to move to Courtney now. Um, so free expression on the internet is essential to everybody, but even, even more for journalists. Um, so do you agree the landscape is, is changing and that, that space for free speech is limiting? And how does it affect the, the journalistic community as you see it? Sure. So we have seen a real development in um, the type and extent of censorship over the past several years. And um, as you mentioned, obviously, journalists re require um, online and mobile technologies to both do their jobs in terms of reporting as well as in terms of dissemination. And I think that if we just take a, a moment to surveil um, or to, rather to survey um, the vast types <laughs> of technologies of censorship, um, certainly surveillance uh, is among those. Um, you know, censorship like blocking uh, both of websites, of specific types of content, of specific applications. Um, what we've seen uh, in terms of surveillance and spyware technology is a, a real evolution um, where Prior, you know, previously it was more of a pull technology where you would have to click on a link. Um, or like when I lived in Dubai and worked as a journalist, the state-owned telecom, you know, sent us an update for the BlackBerry that included spyware in it. So we had to do something to get that spyware installed. But now we're in a push technology where simply having a phone number or an email can then lead to um, the inclusion of surveillance software. Um, on your devices. So how can you even know um, that you're being targeted or surveilled? Uh, we heard about that with Raven, for example, technology that was targeting a Reuters journalist um, <clears throat> with the Pegasus software, which supposedly is sold only to governments for legitimate reasons, but have been linked um, to at least nine Mexican journalists and uh, Jamal Khashoggi, a Saudi journalist who was killed 
um, either to their phones or their, their family's um, software. So really in very sophisticated technology of censorship happening. It's also the, the ubiquity of this surveillance technology and of the kind of power that governments increasingly have over the online space. So as we, increase, we increasingly move towards our smart homes, our smart cities, um, the expansion of facial recognition technologies, the surveillance devices we all hold in our pockets, um, the you know, always on data tracking and, and location tracking, and the com pretty much complete lack of privacy protections um, to control that data. I think it's a real question of where we're headed and whether journalists are going to be able to realistically um, promise a source that they can keep them secure, that they can keep them confidential. Um, we saw, for example, a, a former colleague of mine from the New York Times, Jim Risen, a couple of years ago was subpoenaed to reveal his source um, into a story that was embarrassing to the CIA. They ended up not having to subpoena him because um, you know, they, they got enough signals intelligence basically to make the case um, that this person was, was his source. So the ubiquity of the technologies that are making our lives easier, the smart speakers, the Fitbits, all of these sort of things, I think we have real concerns about what this is going to, um, the, the capabilities that we're creating and how this could be used to surveil and track. And we've seen that in China. So already we see, you know, as, as you mentioned earlier, um, the vast surveillance state that has been set up there has made journalism very, very challenging and independent journalism in China virtually impossible. Then you couple that with things like online harassment which journalists experience as now a regular part of their jobs. If you're a female journalist, if you're a journalist, a minority journalist of a, you know, a minority religion or a racial minority in whatever context you're reporting in, you are almost certainly going to experience online harassment. And online harassment is kind of a generic term that hardly even gets to the type of threats we're talking about. We're talking about death threats, rape threats, threats against children, um, pornography, deep fake um, manipulated images and videos, which can have a devastating effect. We have had to help journalists get out of their countries after being victims of these type of online harassment efforts because they were at risk of being killed or, or harmed. Um, so this has serious consequences, and what we're seeing is that this online harassment in many times is being instigated or inspired by those in power, by the political leaders, including in democratic countries, in Brazil, in India, and here in the United States. You know, we have tracked how when political leaders um, target journalists for, uh, for attacks, and criticism of obviously they're allowed criticism, but you know we have seen attacks where um, Patricio Mello, a, a journalist in Brazil, was attacked by Bolsonaro, and it just leads to these massive online campaigns that make it not only threatening to her family. She worked in uh, war zones and never had to have a bodyguard. She had to have a bodyguard during the elections. Um, so, so both the physical safety, but then also the drowning out of journalism. So through the botnets and troll armies that many governments and um, you know, non-elected governments are employing drowns out journalism. It drowns out the truth. It drowns out the ability to get that information through. So sadly, I'm going to end on a very negative note, but I've been um, doing journalism for almost two decades and in the press freedom community for a decade and I've never seen things so bad. You know, it's, it's very challenging to think how can you as a journalist or even as a media outlet as your economic, you know, sustainability has pull, been pulled out from under you compete in this environment. Thank you very much, uh, Courtney, for that uh, sobering account of, of uh, the landscape as, as you see it for your community. Um, I want to go to Alp uh, now for, uh, for for your remarks. Um, so we've talked we talked for, first about uh, uh, you know policy and legislation and uh, what governments uh, the, the, the the thresholds they have to pass to be able to restrain or restrict content. 
and Courtney started talking a little bit about technology, this is something that you're at the forefront of. Um, please. Right. So <clears throat> I found it very interesting. As we started, we were talking about proportionality. And uh, I'm going to talk about um, perhaps parts of the world where this concept doesn't really exist or isn't applied. Um, NetBlocks, my organization, is a global internet observatory. We track internet shutdowns in real time. Our goal is to detect them, uh, try to hunt them down and develop new methods to identify these when they happen. So we're talking here about entire countries that are switched offline, sometimes regions, uh, sometimes uh, part of a country, but quite often the entire country. This can be done in a variety of reasons. Uh, it can be elections, it can be protests, but also reasons like uh, school exams to prevent uh, children uh, cheating in school exams. There are, there are countries, uh, for example, Iraq, uh, Mauritania, um, around the world, Algeria, which, uh, which will do this. And it, it's, it's a hack on journalism. It's, it's a hack of democracy. It breaks all the systems we know. Um, we, um, so the system, it's, it's a real-time analytic system. We use big data, processing about 5 million data points per minute around the world to see where these uh, blackouts happen. And they can happen for a number of reasons. So it can be state uh, censorship, but it can also be natural events, natural incidents, storms, weather conditions, which also has a huge public interest um, value to report. But we really aim to distinguish these. So um, why do we monitor it and what can we do with that? Um, it turns out that when countries switch off the internet, uh, they act with a sense of impunity, but also they believe that it won't be noticed. And so far, this has been kind of true. Uh, even a few months ago, we detected an outage in, in Benin on election day. And um, we let the news wires know. And, and they, they tried to contact their, their, local, um, their local staff to, to verify this, which meant they couldn't report the news, which means the whole system is hacked. The way we report incidents has been hacked. Uh, we need to change the rule book uh, for, for how we report these incidents. And um, I'm afraid to say it's, it's spreading. Uh, now we've got an election pathfinder, which is a mission to monitor, observe elections in real time, uh, working with um, local election observers and international ones. And uh, we've seen it uh, spread. It's in Latin America, Venezuela, we've seen shutdowns. Uh, 40, I think it's the highest number. It's extraordinary. There was, there was systematic censorship of uh, political speeches um, throughout the first half of the year. And um, we've seen this happen in Iraq just a week ago where you have uh, internet shutdowns being used during killings to suppress these, these extrajudicial extra executions. And through uh, policy work, through advocacy built around data, we've been able to nudge our authorities to act transparently, and, and, and we've been able to uh, maybe shorten the duration of, of these incidents. At least now these are recorded. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Alp. Um, I want to go to uh, Billy now. Uh, you focus on the United States and the legislative legal uh, environment here. Uh, can you tell us something about what are the discussions, the policy discussions taking place in the U.S. on these issues? At, at so time? I think the main primary discussion that you'll see policymakers uh, discussing nowadays uh, and when it comes to free speech online is Section 230 of the Communications Dec Decency Act. Um, so Section 230 states, it's very short and hopefully I remember this correctly, uh, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as a publisher or speaker uh, for purposes of information um, posted on a website unless uh, uh, if it's provided by another information content provider. Um, I was halfway there. Um, so basically what, that, what courts have interpreted that to mean is that you are responsible for the speech that you post on platforms, right? Um, if you want to post something defamatory on Facebook, Facebook isn't responsible for that speech. You are responsible for it. Um, and luckily, this is an area where whether you're a textualist, whether you just look at the text of a statute and just go by that alone when you interpret uh, the law, or whether you're someone who is interested in congressional intent, this is one of those rare situations where, both, uh, where, there, where legal interpretations uh, align with both the um, congressional intent and with the text of the statute itself. Um, when now Senator Wyden um, and then uh, uh, Representative Chris Cox wrote the statute, it was specifically meant to respond to, uh, uh, to legal decisions that basically incentivize websites not to moderate 
content that were posted that was posted on their platforms. Um, the whole point of Section 230 is to allow a free market approach to speech uh, to occur, right? Where Facebook, um, Yelp, uh, Wikipedia, Reddit can all look at the speech that's being posted on their platforms and decide for themselves and for their communities that are posting uh, on those websites what the best types of terms of service are um, and what types of um, free speech regimes are most appropriate uh, for that specific platform. Now the problem that we're seeing is there's been a, mostly a misunderstanding both on the right and the left about number one, what Section 230 does, and number two, how it can be used to deal with legitimate concerns about speech that's being posted online, right? Uh, we have concerns about, um, you know, what types of hate speech are being posted online, concerns about white supremacy, um, and concerns about harassment. Um, and unfortunately, there seems to be this belief that by tweaking Section 230, um, that it will incentivize um, Facebook or other major companies to uh, basically adopt the, the perfect sort of um, free speech regime that works for all. Um, and the main problem with that is that every platform is different. Um, and for working in Congress, I could just tell you that whenever you think, well, hard cases make bad law, right? And I think that goes for policy as well. Um, everyone might recognize that there's, that the status quo of how, um, might have problems with how the status quo on, of online free speech is operating. Um, but as soon as we try to get that through the legislative process, um, without a clear understanding on both sides, on the Republican and Democrat parties, about um, what exact what objectives they want to achieve here, um, I think we're just set up to fail in regards to um, uh, uh, pinpointing the exact sorts of speeches, uh, types of speech we want to um, to, uh, to to moderate, basically. Um, and the last thing I'll note is that we have a clear example of that through FOSS and SESTA that was passed a few years ago, right? Um, that dealt with a very re legitimate and very concerning issue, right? No one wants um, you know, people to be sex trafficked online, right? Um, and no, I assume, with, with the exception of Backpage, no platform wants that either. Um, but um, honestly, if I was an attorney for, uh, for a platform and they asked me, well, what types of speech dealing with sex work could I post on my platform, I would just say none. Because the types of language that's included in FOSTA SESTA is so broad that even legitimate speech that isn't trying to facilitate um, sex work in any form or fashion could be covered broadly by that statute. Um, so I, my main point I want people to recognize is that you know American exceptionalism uh, in the internet is a real thing, right? There's a reason why Reddit is here, why Wikipedia is here, why Yelp is here. Um, and trying to change the status quo of what's allowed online is going to change, is going to prevent that sort of innovation from occurring um, later on as well in this country. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, I, th I think it's very true that uh, the internet, as we know it, would have looked extremely different had it emerged in Germany. Let's say if, if the main companies had had emerged out of that uh, legal uh, uh, tradition. Um, please. I mean, I think that's true, but I don't think we can just go back to the future and, you know, talk about, well, if it had been different. We have to talk about now. And we are in <clears throat> a very different speech environment. And some of our paradigms, um, such as fighting speech with better speech, don't really work anymore on the Internet. Because what we see is that countries, you know, as diverse as, you know, China, Iran, and Bahrain, but also democratic countries, um, are buying bots and you know botnets to counteract speech, and so you know if you can drown out that speech, it, that that equation is, is really hard to hold up anymore. Mm -hmm. You know when you have this surveillance arm race happening, and we know that people communicate differently when they believe they're under surveillance, um, or if their data is being collected. Um, you know, I think we are in a different environment, and I'm not saying you know we don't have a position one way or the other on Section 230, but I think it behooves us to get out of this idea that, well, if we hadn't had this, the internet wouldn't have developed. We have that protection. The internet has developed, but it's different now. 
you know, in 2006 and 8, I was in Egypt writing about, you know, how social media networks were being used to instigate political change. And then we, we saw an uprising throughout those regions. That could not happen, I don't think, anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen that squashed. We just saw it squashed in Iraq recently and Egypt recently. So it is a different environment and we need to update our thinking. So I would encourage us to get beyond this idea that we, we can't touch the traditional framework. We need to think about what frameworks can we have to protect people's privacy, protect the ability of individuals to speak online. Right. Good points, good points. Does anybody want to respond? To yeah, I, I want to respond to that. I mean, look, the, the internet has, the, the sorts of situations that we're dealing with now are not the sorts of situations that were being dealt with in 1996 when Section 230 was passed. I grant you that. Um, as, a, as a policy person, my main concern is the sorts of alternatives that people are, um, are bringing out to, to deal with those situations would result in less speech. I'm not sure how any of the policy frameworks that Beto O'Rourke or Joe Biden recently decided to, to jump into this debate about Section 230, um, or, uh, or um, Senator Cruz or Senator Josh Hawley, none of their frameworks deal with the sorts of situations that, that you bring up. And I don't believe either that they would deal with uh, concerns about harassment or other issues on, with online speech. Um, I mean, if, if I thought lawmakers were thinking thoughtfully about this and were coming up with meaningful policy frameworks that would deal with these concerns, maybe we could have that conversation. But at this point, I don't think it would end up in a, in a sort of framework that would actually provide um, more speech online mm -hmm. or protect the interests that I think everyone here kind of wants to protect. Thanks for that. Uh, so I, I, coming back to what you said, I, you know, working in the European context, I think it's very clear that, as, as you say, that, you know, th these services, you know, internet communication is way different now than it was um, back in the day when, when these laws were, were, were put in place. And I think it is also clear that when policymakers, um, uh, you know, desire more speech restricted, they're not always ill-intentioned, right? And you, you, you talked about the real issues about harassment and about, uh, uh, you know, uh, female journalists facing all kinds of threats online. Those, those issues are real, right? They, they do have impact. Um, so I think one challenge for government policy here is, given that the government is restricted from banning speech or, uh, 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 or suppressing speech, which is not illegal, what then do you do with harmful content? Well, do you have uh, do you have views on that? Because I think those that's those are going to be key questions in, in in debates that we are going to be getting into. And uh, maybe Evelyn, from a, from a legal perspective, what, how do you think about this? Yeah. Well, um, is it working? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Thanks so much. Um, you know. As a former U.S. government attorney uh, in the free speech space, we did believe that there was a lot the government should do to help promote free speech other than banning speech. And that was something we worked on for 10 years at the United Nations because there was a, a big move to criminalize blasphemy mm -hmm. in international law. And we were on the losing end of that fight for many years uh, until we turned it around towards the end of the uh, first term of the Obama administration. Um, and basically, it was having that hard conversation with governments about what are you doing to solve a certain problem other than banning speech. Because everybody turns to that quickly as the knee-jerk fix. And when you really make people sit down and walk through empirical evidence of what works to solve intolerance or other harms, it is really hard for them to justify broad speech bans. Um, and, but we need to be having those conversations about how to solve these very, very difficult and horrific things that happen online, but what actually works and what, who's doing things that work, media literacy, digital literacy, all kinds of programs are out there, but who's bringing us together to have that conversation in a systemic way? That's what we had to force at the UN to avoid a treaty that would ban uh, criminalized blasphemy. Mm -hmm. um, but when we put down a whole toolkit um, of things the U.S. government tended to do in that space for religious intolerance, and other countries couldn't match it. All they had were bans on speech. Then we had the conversation. Mm -hmm. So just from that experience, I, I just I wish for a forum for us today to have those hard conversations um, 
uh, that I think can lead to breakthroughs in this space. Because I am very worried that we actually end up um, rewarding bad actors by giving them censorship powers. So uh, the governments that throw out the bots, they win if we increase the power of governments to censor, right? Mm -hmm. um, and similarly for tech companies, if they have algorithms that promote hate speech and then we empower them to censor, we've just, you know, uh, uh, rewarded someone who's engaged in bad act, uh, bad actor activity. Right. So I, I really hope we can get back to that conversation of what works and how do we do it without speech bans. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I would completely agree and work on that issue as well with blasphemy. I think it's a great example where the issue in a lot of these cases is not about the content itself. It's about something, for example, privacy, right? The issues around micro-targeting and manipulation of people's beliefs and behaviors could become less concerning if there were greater privacy restrictions and thoughts about you know, transparency of advertising, about the ability to micro-target. You know, can you micro-target, um, you know, to minority communities, you know, or restrict their access to advertising on X, Y, or Z? You know, there are a lot of things that have very little to do with speech that we should be thinking about. You know, how can you address the ability of content to go viral, right? If you think about the Christchurch call mm -hmm. and this effort by New Zealand to apparently eradicate terrorism from the internet is bound to um, result in very important content like documentation of human rights abuses and reporting from restrictive environments. Um, so I think we have to get away from thinking about how do we regulate speech and how do we regulate things like algorithmic transparency, um, like requiring um, lists of content and accounts taken down under different rubrics so that independent researchers and journalists can review that to see how um, algorithmic choices or content moderation choices are being implemented and, and the results of that. You know, looking at privacy protection so that micro-targeting and manipulation becomes more difficult. Looking at, you know, the difference between, say, authentic real-life actors online versus, you know, botnets or inauthentic speech. You know, there's a lot that can be done that doesn't actually have to get into the very difficult and thorny subject of content. Mm. Very good point, very good point. Thanks. Within you had, the you had a... European framework, I think uh, there's this idea that everything's rosy and perfect, and unfortunately uh, it isn't really. Uh, there's also problems with, with the UN at the moment. If you look at the composition of the HRC, uh, it's quite difficult to get an unequivocal statement about uh, whether freedom should be protected and how it should be protected. And uh, these, these are powerful and useful institutions, but uh, in, a, in a sense, uh, they're in crisis. And you look and you see a backslide. I can tell you that when it happens, it will be swift. We've seen this again and again in countries that were leaders in their region. I, I gave one example earlier on election day. Bam, gone. Um, this was meant to be a country that, was, um, that had uh, an improving governance situation. But also Spain. I mean, this is, this is a shocker. And in our data sets... Uh, it's been sliding and sliding down, and there's no conversation about this. Uh, there was the referendum, the contested Catalan referendum, uh, and we detected the first internet shutdowns in the EU uh, dur during that, uh, at least the first ones that were validated with data. And uh, censorship has continued. It, it's uh, very concerningly, not only the censorship of speech, of content, but also of the tools that people use, mm. the software, the source code, to these tools has been censored. I think we've only seen this one or two countries, maybe China, um, not something that happens even in the countries that, that are on the red list of, of uh, problem countries. So mm. rapid backslide can happen. It can happen in places with a very strong legal framework and it can be very difficult for neighbors to speak out because there is this, this, this pedestal that, that these countries have put on. And um, it, sometimes it can be dangerous to play with those founding rules and laws that produce a red line for speech and its protection. Can, can I ask you a follow-up on, on that? Do you think, so in, when you look at, at situations, you know, widely in different countries that you operate with, um, when, uh, for example, the EU moves ahead with policy that we as free expression advocates think go too far, do you then see a risk that those policies become models for repressive 
authoritarian regimes to, to, to replicate and, and they can point to the EU saying, well, the Europeans are doing that, why shouldn't we? Do you think that is a, a real thing? It's a brilliant question. And that was our first concern. Um, we, at the beginning, were worried about how this would uh, give a green card for other countries to do the same, uh, perhaps in a more deadly fashion. Uh, we, we work with the EEAS, which is the external action unit of, of the EU. Uh, but uh, when we took the same issues to the FRA, which is the internal human rights agency mm. of the EU, we got a completely different experience, complete disinterest in tracking the exact same technical class of incident, the exact same uh, filtering, SNI, DPI, DNS filtering, or shutdowns of, of internet connectivity happening within the EU, zero interest. So, uh, yeah, we started with this fear that it would enable, facilitate other countries. But now we're actually quite concerned about those countries themselves. Thank you. Uh, we've also seen that on the right to be forgotten, which I think is like a perfect example mm. of where you had an EU... Uh, ruling at the European Court of Human Rights um, with a very, you know, to go back to Evelyn's point, like unclear, unspecific ruling um, about uh, this right to be forgotten. And, you know, is this a right to delist? Is this a right to erasure? It doesn't really matter. It's not that the country, so what we've seen is it proliferate around the world. So in Latin America, um, in um, Asia, where it's being interpreted by governments, even in Italy, now, um, to not only refer to the delisting of search results for somebody's name, but we've seen, for example, in Italy, a newspaper who has gone out of business because the local judiciary decided to interpret the right to be forgotten as the right to go to the source, the original journalistic material, to take that, that information offline. And that poor newspaper just could not keep up with the requests. And you know, we're seeing that around the world with this idea of you know, we want to balance the, the ability of people to you know, get away from their past or whatever on Google um, now being you know, expanded to the original source and then literally leading to erasure. There's an interesting case in, I believe it's Cleveland, where a news organization has decided to do that themselves. They've decided editorially they will entertain requests mm -hmm. to remove articles about people. And that's different mm -hmm. than saying, like, we have a ruling, we're going to have a regulation, and we're going to impose this on you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are different ways to apply that. But certainly the European approach is interpreted um, and reinterpreted around the world. I just, I just want to add that that sort of um, anecdote about that kind of illustrates what my concern about Section 230 is in regards to the, the, the regulatory cost of adding more regulations on, on free speech online, right? If you're a blogger, if you write for Popville or New Columbia Heights, right, both blogs that my husband loves to read uh, here in DC, um, then if you know that you are gonna be responsible for every statement that someone puts, uh, every comment that someone puts in a comment box, mm -hmm. right, then do you really wanna maintain that those comment structures at all, right? If you know that that could open you up to mm -hmm. a libel or a defamation suit, um, so I just want to add that I think, um, like in Europe, I mean, people need to, policymakers need to be very considerate about what sorts of regulatory structures journalists and other, um, uh, and other institutions are going to be able to handle hmm. if they decide to change free speech laws generally. We're going to open it up to questions in a couple of minutes, but just before we do, um, we've kind of hinted at the responsibilities of, of companies, right? And, um, and, and the large social media platforms are, of course, now spaces for, for information exchange and public debate and so on. And, you know, everybody has opinions about how they do that. Uh, do you, does anybody want to just to comment on sort of the responsibility of companies in this space? Because clearly when, when, when governments want to uh, restrict speech, they have to go through companies more, uh, often. Uh, Evelyn? So, you know, if we were having this conversation 15 years ago, we might be having a lot of hand-wringing, I think, over that question, what is the responsibility of, of, uh, of platforms in this space, of social media companies, et cetera. But and now we have really great frameworks uh, that we can look at. So in 2011, the United Nations adopted, with the endorsement of the U.S. government, the U.N. Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Um, and the uh, U.S. government has told uh, its companies that it expects them to treat these principles as a, a, a floor, not a ceiling in their operations. So that's pretty strong um, words from the U.S. government. 
And essentially, the responsibility is to respect international human rights in, the, in their operation. And that means uh, seeking to avoid infringing on those rights. So if you're like a social media company and you're facing these types of laws that we're talking about uh, today on the panel, you need to assess where there's a delta a difference between those laws and international human rights standards. And if those laws don't meet those standards, you need to develop an action plan to resist assisting with uh, censorship that's illicit under international law. And that may mean taking that country to court in its own courts in that country. It might mean enlisting the help of your home government or the UN's machinery, uh, narrowly construing the requests, etc. cetera. Um, and the, the framework also provides for uh, remedies uh, when infringements happen. Um, but you know, doing nothing or blindly following local laws is no longer acceptable. Um, I would also mention there's now the Global Network Initiative in which companies, NGOs, investors, and civil society sign up to do exactly that, to promote um, good uh, corporate responsibility when it comes to free speech and privacy uh, rules that governments implement that do not meet these international standards and helping companies push back. Um, and there are major companies in that initiative um, Google, Facebook, and others. Um, so I think we do have these frameworks and we just need to implement them a little more robustly. I would say one very specific thing, which is um, there need to be better hiring practices and res and um, uh, review and, and uh, of employee access to data with the recent revelations of Saudi spies in Twitter and the potential link to some journalists who are in jail and perhaps have even been um, targeted for uh, physical attacks. So that's one very specific mm -hmm. thing that you know has nothing to do with moderating content, but they should absolutely be responsible for monitoring what sort of access um, employees have and making sure that they don't have access to stuff they shouldn't. Good point. And just to dial back to the economic cost, uh, this is a surprisingly, um, it, it's, it's a growing area of research, but it's a surprisingly powerful tool. If you can enumerate how much it costs to businesses, corporations, but not just the ICT industry, but everyone who used the internet, whether it's selling something, farmers who are trading things. We built a tool called the Cost of Shutdown Tool, which calculates the cost of online censorship. And uh, this has been adopted very widely over the last year. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's in the link in the booklet. So it, it's one other way of phrasing free expression issues, perhaps sometimes in environments where um, human rights or free expression aren't um, given um, the, the, the response they should. Thank you, Alp. With that, I think we'll go to uh, questions from the floor. So uh, please get your most incisive questions ready. Uh, please keep them relatively brief so we get as many people we, as we can. The gentleman right there. Yeah. Bill Bush, at GiraffeTooTail.com. Last weekend, there was a big furor over YouTube's terms of service, and there was a rumor that they would knock off people who didn't make money with their stuff. That in other words, that websites could pay their own way. And that's actually a very serious, that, that didn't really turn out to be true. Um, I had made a video about that that got a lot of hits on Sunday. I think that independent creators, there's a, isn't there a lot of controversy with the fact that independent creators are competing with larger media co companies and lowballing them and making it harder for bigger companies to be profitable? And that activists, particularly on the left, feel that independent speakers undermining their activism when if we weren't around, we would have to join them and break money from them rather than do our own thing. I had made a video about that that was very popular somewhere. Isn't that a practical problem? In other words, who gets to have the floor is, more, is as much an, is, is an issue as what the actual content is. And if we didn't have so many independent speakers, there would be a lot more solidarity, particularly on the left for minorities and so forth. That, I've heard that theory. I think you have to take it very seriously in a practical way that the, a lot of this is going on. You know, I know Tim Pool and some other people have talked about it. I'm just wondering if you can react to that. So the question is, right, is about who gets access to the platforms, right? And, and who gets access to have their content promoted? This is a com competitive environment. Right. You know, David Paxman has talked about it a lot, too. Some, some mm. of the blogs there. Are we doing one question at a time? Or what? We, we may, we'll, let's bank that and then we'll take, there was another question at the end, down, the gentleman down there, and then we'll, we'll take a few and then come to answers. Uh, 
Other questions? There's a gentleman there. Thank you very much. I think we'll uh, go to the panel for responses. Uh, you can probably pick and choose a little bit where you want to focus, but uh, who wants to go first? Sure. Uh, so encryption. Um, wow, we've been here before, haven't we? Uh, 90s, clipper chip, uh, research of uh, Professor Ross Anderson. Uh, we've figured out that it's not going to work. You can't uh, kind of selectively do a crypto. Um, it's, it's got to be all or nothing. And what you're going to do is you're going to undermine the security of the public. You're going to undermine financial security. You're going to give a backdoor to adversaries who would like nothing more than to access your content. Uh, the risk is so great. There might be a theoretical framework where you can, where you can kind of encrypt for a few different uh, users and then give, give one, one access to, of one key to, to the authorities, to the government. But the problem is you're putting all your eggs in one basket. It only takes one leak, one disaster to ruin your country. This can never be a good idea. Um, and I think it should be asked who stands to profit uh, when, when, when these laws are pushed. I, I think there's a serious concern here. And it remains unaddressed. Anybody else? Um, just uh, a quick one on, on Jason's uh, question about the recent cases. Um, yeah, I think these cases uh, decided by the European Court of Justice don't comport with international human rights standards. I think it's hard to make the case that they reflect the least intrusive means on speech, do global takedowns, and I think they have a variety of other issues too. And one of the, the tricks is going to be, I think, how to have uh, a dialogue with um, our European colleagues about some of these issues because their regional human rights system is different on speech than the international human rights system. And the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, the top expert in this field, called Europe out on this in his October report to the UN General Assembly. And he said, you know, your standards are different than the international ones, and following your standards does not justify violating international standards. So I think there needs to be more in the advocacy world to, to have that conversation directly about that division between the regional European system and the international system, because there are risks with regard to other regional systems and the international system as well. Um, and in terms of the encryption um, question, I think uh, it's great for civil society to use the international mechanisms that exist. And I think right now, a fantastic advocate um, would be the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, who is doing a lot of deep studies and putting a lot of pressure on countries. And I think directly reaching out to him would probably be the, the fastest um, way forward on that. Um, if I can drop one more uh, point about our earlier discussion um, at the United Nations and, and standards on freedom of expression, I would say the United States, and I worked nine years for the State Department in the trenches of the UN, the United States is a unique voice on freedom of expression in, at the United Nations. And the fact that it has pulled out from the Human Rights Council and is no longer a voice at the table for freedom of expression means all the norms from other countries, that's what's getting fought and, and promoted at the UN. And um, I would hope if there's ever a discussion again at the United States uh, government, within the US government, about whether to rejoin the council, that the people who care about freedom of speech, not just Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the typical international NGOs, the general <coughs> free speech advocates um, would make their voices known to the United States on that front. Thank you. And you could add to that UNESCO, because they've also pulled out of the UNESCO. Um, with respect to encryption, um, we have done studies about uh, how this could impact journalists. And journalists obviously rely quite a bit on encryption, um, especially when they're reporting on sensitive stories, um, including in the United States. And it just isn't technically possible to have a backdoor to encryption. And um, 
you know, no offense to policymakers, but I think a lot of them don't necessarily really understand a lot of the technology that they're trying to um, create rules for. And so there needs to be a lot more learning around that. And you know, just to add to uh, Evelyn's response to Jason's question, it's not only about um, Europe's efforts to globalize its ruling, it's about what does the precedent, what precedent does that set? What happens when Turkey is like, yeah, we want our takedowns applied globally as well, you know, or Ecuador or, you know, any, any um, entity. And so I think, you know, Europe needs to think very carefully about how much it wants to push yeah. that. So that question was addressed to me, but I, I feel like the other speakers have, have expounded on that very well and, and, and stated, uh, you know, views that are very similar to what, what we as CDT say about this. Are there any final, final questions? The gentleman there. Yes, I'm David Sachs. I'm an independent psychologist concerned with media literacy and also creating a level playing field for democracy. And my question is, uh, what's going to happen during the 2020 election campaign? And how can ordinary citizens know what is real? Is there any hope of restricting or identifying at least the roles of foreign actors or rich Americans in manipulating the election. I, I just want to know, it's, it's already illegal for foreign actors to engage in some of the actions that people are really talking about here in terms of trying to influence people through, um, through buying ads or other issues like this. So, I mean, the, the other thing I want to talk about, I just want to mention here, because in your question, you brought up how do we make a level playing field? Um, and as someone who cares deeply about this topic, about the intersection between free speech and, and, uh, and technology, I don't see any way that you create a level playing field through regulations um, that doesn't silence other people's voices. So I just think that people need to be very careful about using policy um, or you know, pressuring companies to, um, to, to stop posting political ads out of some um, sort of paternalistic viewpoint that that's the only way to protect the people from false information. False information has been part of a republic for, since the inception of it, right? I mean, go read what, you know, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were saying about each other, right? Um, the American people are smart. They'll be able to look at information. They'll be able to determine what's right and what's not. And the other, the other extreme of that is having some form of either corporate or government censorship that is going to lead to a worse place. That's my view. I well, well, I don't, I don't agree that you know all form of regulation is bad. Some form of regulation is good. Increasing regulation around transparency is good. I'm not clear on why we're only, you know, the platforms are only agreeing to be transparent on political ads. When not, why not all ads? I think you know there are definitely areas that we can regulate. Of course, when we get into regulating types of speech, you know, it's problematic. But we regulate broadcasters. Um, you know, we regulate things that are considered scarce resources. You can regulate how data is used, how people are able to be targeted, and that sort of thing. And to your, so I think you can look at regulations that are helpful and can help um, improve the ability of democracy to potentially function. And then, you know, how you think about media information literacy, look at, you know, first of all, subscribe to an actual news outlet, um, support journalism. Like, it costs money to do good journalism. And look at the indicators. Think about going directly to a news site instead of trying to get it through an app or a platform so that you are seeing the editorial choices that that news organization made. Or you know, follow your favorite podcaster, you know, your favorite journalist who's creating micro credits. You know, there's a lot of interesting things being done in journalism, but um, it's, it, you have to pay for it if you want good journalism. We are out of time. I'll allow. 30 seconds. Right, okay. So I'd just double down on what Courtney said, and I'd actually suggest an action item. We need observability and we need monitorability of these platforms, and we need it now. I've just told you about internet measurements. We can measure what's on the wire, but it's completely opaque to us as monitors what happens within that platform. These companies need to provide endpoints so that we can monitor content as it goes in and as it leaves uh, with due regard to privacy so that we can understand when there is an attack happening and we can actually improve the status quo and the technology to better support human rights and democracy on the platforms. With that, 
we are at an end. I want to thank our stellar panel. Uh, There, there is much more to say about this, and you can talk to our panelists in the break that's going to come now. We have 20 minutes break now. Thank you very much.